coconuts, as we know, is one of the pioneer crops that has taken care of the livelihood of our people for more than 80 years until uh, 17 years ago. Something happened. And those cash flow wasn't coming in to Manus. Foreign currencies through the industry is not coming to Manus. We will know the reason why um, in my presentation, but let me say that it wasn't uh, a decision the extension officers or the DAL or even our leaders here did, but it was the reform the government has to go through. Um, the shift from CMB, from a corporate marketing board, to Coconuts Industry Corporation. They have to sell the, um, the marketing facility for the growers of Manus. So there was no marketing place to market the, the copra for our, our village people. And that is why it's been like this until today. Um, today we try to find a solution. What solution can we uh, take using the same um, stocks, coconut stocks that we have, in the coconut area, the hectares, and uh, same labor. Maybe all the, pe all the people have died, but the young generations today to produce and make a livelihood out of coconut again. Um, let us answer this. Come, come with me and let us all answer this uh, the question of the um, autonomy. Um, coconut palm is, is first accepted. We all must take it that we must accept coconut as our staple food. That is number one. Let's take our mind away from coconut being traded as cash. First of all, it is food item that all the households, the 100% household of Manus and Papua New Guinea are consuming today. And science have proven that out of coconut, it is the best oil, it is the best food that our bodies need. Apart from the refined bleached and deodorized oil that we consume, all of us here consume in the stores. Our old people were saying, they made a statement. The statement is, they embraced God for how God created this palm. And they say there is none, no plant on earth compared to coconut palm, which God created yielding water and food in the sky. Let's see how people embraced the creation of coconut palm that grows water and food in the air. So that is how our people embrace coconut and embrace their creator. Excuse me. Will Malus coconut industry be a viable sound rural economy to support the road to autonomy? So walk with me in this presentation and let us all answer this. State of coconut economy in Manus, coconut plantation and copra commerce since 1930s and 1944, when the colonials came, they settled, developed coconut plantations, drew out our biomass, took them away to the European countries, maybe 
in uh, German, England somewhere. We don't know how much volume of those biomass has been taken away. But they planted coconut plantations. And since then, Manus people, our older generations, where were we, or what were they doing in this industry? I suppose they were being employed as just labor on their land and coconut plantations. Comes post-war, World War II, 30 years pre-independence, coconut plantations were producing, yielding copra into the markets in the United States and Europe. And we Manusians were just being used as labor. The three development factors, that is land, labor, and time, that we Manus used during those times. And we were only laborers earning a wage out of our sweat, of our work. Post-1950, small oral development policies, Coconut and cocoa were plantation crop and there were restrictions in those crops. No small holder would be planting those coconuts. Until then changes came and small holder blocks were being developed. Coconuts were given to to village people to plant. And there comes government development uh, programs and there was a law that every single person, male especially, will have to plant 25 coconut each in all the villages. It took place in everywhere. I think someone was saying Palau movement. Palau was a councillor um, before. And uh, it happened in also in Kurti, in PNKA. So at that, that time, as I can understand, some people planted coconuts on different land. I mean, today you can find there's some disputes um, taking place because of coconut belongs to someone else and the land belongs to someone else. <clears throat> Manus population is 60,000, a bit more. Manus household population is 30,000. Um, Manus copper industry earnings. At the time was about 0.5 to 1 million kina income coming into the to the province. Manus copper production areas. These are the areas. A total to 6,000 plantation, especially. And uh, sorry about those zero mark on our Hulu and. The Nabu and Los Negros, because I didn't have the data. Um, I did use the um, NGIP report previously, conducted about 20 years ago. And those information weren't there. I'm, I'm very sorry for that. But in total, um, smallholder is 3,000 hectares. In total, we have about 10,000 hectares of land cultivated into a bit more cultivated into uh, coconut. These are the figures we, we can give, how much in terms of uh, volume and value. Up on the board there, I cannot uh, elaborate too much on that. This is a graph too showing the state of copra supporting money's livelihood after 2002. Oh, shift, sorry. We go back. There was one graph that has been affected, it's not here. But after that, um, 1997 to 2001, there were some activities on, on copra. After 2001, that is the blue graph. Blue lines, that is 2001, 
that this is the last uh, corporate activity. In 2002, you see the brown and the um, green squares. 2002 up to today, 2019, there is no corporate activity, meaning there's no cash flow coming into the province. That is about 17 years now. So how do we how do we see that? That's the state of economy in, in industry today. <clears throat> These are some questions we all can uh, ask and answer it, but let it, uh, let me leave it to you later, you can answer them way forward. Just a way forward, I have been working on a, a project, um, after the project, Mr. Stephen Pokowin had introduced into into the province back in 1998, 97, 99, sorry. That's the DME, direct micro expelling on virgin coconut oil. One in Park and one in Sopala. I worked on another project in 2011. And that is when we start to develop the idea of getting virgin coconut oil um, as an alternative of copra industry. So, we have these four points here. Manus, population be seriously cautious of health risk and disease and cease from high intake of import RBD oils. That's information to us all. We must understand this quality of the oils that we're eating from the stores and the quality of the oil that we are producing now and introducing and hopefully we will People of that as our industry. Now there's Manus population create domestic market in Manus by consuming Manus made organic virgin coconut oil and materials at 100%. Only if Manus consume that oil, we can develop that market in here. We all can understand domestic market in coconut oil is huge, and also in Papua New Guinea is lucrative. So months alone, we can generate more than six million kina. To make a contrast to the whatever intake we're importing from import from those oils, I don't have the data, but we can work on that later. And. Um, The third is money systematically accept the adaptation of the VCO industry, commerce to make it a turnaround and develop homegrown national product and gain ownership of the entire industry. I'm saying this because I'm serious. We all can do it. Can we develop a product? Becomes a national product? Right now we don't. We only use our raw material and send it to the market to gain foreign currency. The copra prices have been challenged by, by all the vegetable oils. In America today, they're investing highly on research on soybean oil. Therefore, the market in America has dropped. So today, copra oil is being challenged. And therefore, these copra farmers are earning about 25 kina a bag of copra, 30 kina a bag of copra. It's all this labor intensive time and resource invested into producing a bag of copra or ton of copra. It is like laboring for someone else. And if Ted was here, I think he'll talk more about this. Develop revitalization program 
at small holding options. So this young man here is our target, money's target, from zero to 35 years. Behind him is the product that uh, we are talking about. He says, we can domesticate growth of manus coconut virgin oil industry for manus. We can grow this virgin coconut oil firstly because it's healthy food and we all can consume it to be healthy and live a happy life. And secondly, if we create that market, we consume it here, we will create that market here. And we have our cash flow, you know, circulating in Manus. And also Papua New Guinea as well. This are uh, the same information about the hectares we have, and that converts to I'm doing the wrong thing, sorry. Where are we going? Okay, let us look at this opportunity assessment. Contrast in manus industry yield returns. Copra versus virgin coconut oil. And on this graph here, you can see below is all the LLGs that produce copra in the last five years, in the five years of the last 20 years, 1997 to 2001. Balopa. Rapatona, Los Nibos, Loreal, Lelebupi, PNGA, Visakani, Obuma, Enabu, and Western. Copra price is on the blue line. The virgin VCO, if we cultivate, produce VCO, the price you will see is at this brown lines. Sierra Patona at 1,600,000 kil a year. This is the earning we will earn from virgin coconut oil. You don't believe? You must believe that. Target VCO market is Manus. We have this production capacity, 502,330 liters. Our target population is 30,000 at 10 a minimum usage 10 liters a year. We can consume 300,000 liters. The target VCO market price is about 20, 20 kina, can be reduced to 10 kina, but the rest work on 20 as a test price. Now, domestic market money will be worth 6 million kina. Another target markets from our excess, our excess oil will be 202,000 liters. Where will we sell it? We have Papua New Guinea here. We can still consume a lot of oil and we can send it to the rest of the country. And offshore, of course, we can always source offshore market with virgin coconut oil with higher price. Domestic market in PNG is worth, for us minus from our excess, is worth four million. So altogether we can earn 10 million kina besides copra. It's about 900% from copra production and copra earnings. These are values of the RBD oils, just briefly. Um, store oil contain, I mean, they used to refine bleach and deodorize, they clean and they make it smell good. But those are old oils, long stocks. And uh, it involves about 13 carcinogenic materials, cancer related, um, causing diseases. And for manus, this virgin coconut oil, we have zero chemical involved. 
So, for further reading, you can, you can go through uh, Dr. Mary Annick on the website and says, access more information on that. Rabatona more concept. I'd like to acknowledge Sarabatona local level government and the, the uh, Air Assembly for working with them. We start to develop uh, two projects. One is Lambuso Coco. And in fact, we have exported first export of Coco man, from months out to Japan for your information. Um, we understand that markets have been liberalized. It's open. It's open market and it's liberalized market already, so we can access those uh, markets through micro export. Just as well, Coco Board was reviewing its export act, and we managed to take the first micro export license last year, and we exported half a ton to Japan. Thank you to Rabadona. And we are pursuing the virgin coconut oil in Rapatona, training the mamas in Rapatona. And um, there they are, all Moklan mamas. We train them how to process virgin coconut oil. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, our chairman, Teresa Kass, would you please uh, hold some of these samples? This is Manu's label, remember, our own label. We designed, sent it for printing, and we have this label here, special bottle sealed. Um, and we try to make it marketable. <laughs> we try to make it marketable on the shelves of the stores in Manus and in Papua New Guinea. So we're just going through some mapping. Um, indeed, it's a lot of a lot of mapping as well. Uh, map our products, cocoa and coconut. And let's get into the uh, next stage of our national, I call it national product. Let's produce a national product and, and market it out. We don't have our national product like this one. We only sell raw materials outside. And they develop a their product and sell it back. So for us, we must be smart and start developing this. So those are mamas from Banselu and Kulwo, Bunro, Lomat, and Popel. And after training, you can see Rapadona creates doorstep marketing environment. They go to purchase oils from the mamas from Rapadona. It's like three times now that happened so from this soil you can see now it turned into this one so we have our bottles here this is Manus Agro Products Limited from Manus entirely not Rambutso not Lele Buki but Manus <laughs> and let me go through this quickly this is Coco um, Clone, we will be doing a uh, juvenile budding next week. Um, this is getting the co cocoa bags from the export test that we, we did, fermentation and drying. Went through special uh, fermentation days and drying to Loringa, and this is Timothy working on the, thanks to Timothy, working on the uh, conditioning of cocoa again in, in, in using the solar. Uh, that's him packing the cocoa, sealing it in these plastic bags, and sitting with the, uh, the Japanese partner, the one that we are selling, or the one that is buying our cocoa. So this is all the partnership uh, we have done for Lampuso. And it says, this international market is another smarter approach for Manus. Do you agree? Yes. Thank you. Um, I pose the question back to the working committee. Is this presentation and the practice 
in this presentation, gearing the industry economy towards a pathway to autonomy. You can answer that later. So I see you as Thank you.